For the second book in the Republic Commando series, Triple Zero, Karen Travis finished her manuscript in five weeks. Using the bits of the Mandalorian language that was in the Republic Commando video game, she developed more of the language, she developed extensive backstories for characters. Instead of taking place on a remote planet, the majority of Triple Zero is set on Coruscant. Omega Squad and others are not directly fighting Separatists, but instead trying to uncover this Separatist bombing plot. And Travis said that her first readers of the story found it very emotional. You could say that Karen Travis was very invested here. So as with Hard Contact, I'm pretty sure that I read Triple Zero, but I didn't remember any of the actual details of it. I think I knew going in that this was the Coruscant one, but all the stuff going on with uncovering this bombing plot, no memories whatsoever. So first, a brief summary. A surge in Separatist bombings has been linked to a Separatist terror cell embedded within the Republic's capital. And it's obvious that they're receiving information from a mole within the Republic army itself. So Omega Squad, Delta Squad, and others are sent to Coruscant to identify and destroy the Separatist terrorists. But this mission is unlike any they've carried out before will require new talents and skills, and victory is not assured. If Hard Contact was fast-paced and tightly focused on the four commandos of Omega Squad and a Jedi Padawan, Triple Zero gets a bit more complex. As the novel opens, General Jedi Etain Tirmukin and her forces are trying to rescue battalions that are trapped on the world of Dinlo, while Omega Squad is investigating these bombings that are occurring, and so they're waiting to catch these ships coming out of hyperspace. Etain's forces are successful, but suffer a lot of casualties. Omega Squad ends up being trapped. Their getaway vehicle is destroyed, and they are dependent on other forces coming to rescue them, which includes Delta Squad, the protagonist of the Republic Commando video game, as well as Etain and her forces. At the same time, there have been bombings happening on Coruscant at Republic Army locations, and Sergeant Cal Scarada and others are investigating those. So really, that main focus of the novel, the investigation into the Separatist terrorist cells, doesn't kick off until more than a hundred pages into the novel. And the group investigating these Separatist terrorist cells consists of Sergeant Cal Scarada, Sergeant Val, the frankly sadistic Mandalorian who trained Delta Squad and a teen, Omega Squad, Delta Squad, Etain, another Jedi, Barden Jusik, and one of the first round or null ARC troopers, Ordo. Their investigation is fairly long and convoluted, but culminates in them saying, hey, we've got bombs for sale. The terrorist cell contacted them being like, we would like to buy your bombs, and then them waiting for them to buy the bombs so they can take them all out. There's also, oh, a fair bit of interpersonal drama going on, but we'll talk about that in a bit. If Hard Contact's main viewpoints were Niner, Darman, and Etain, this time around our main viewpoint characters are Etain, Calscarada, Phi, and the Null Trooper Ordo. That basically means that we have Skarada, the fount of knowledge, two clone troopers who think the world of Skarada, and then Etain, who continues to frustrate me here. So let's talk about Phi and the Omega guys first. They've got new armor. They requested stuff that would camouflage a bit better than blinding white or silver, and then they got black, which doesn't really help with what they're doing here. At least they got upgrades. Phi continues to make a lot of jokes, but I think you also get the sense that he's starting to realize 
how much he's missed out on, especially being on Coruscant and seeing all this flurry of activity around you, seeing families and people who have grown up in normal settings, and then there's Fi, who's one of millions of identical clones and they didn't have childhoods at all and they only have each other and it really opens this lack and this need in him of realizing what he's gone without and what he does not have. A teen has some conflicts because we finally get the story behind his scar which was that after the Battle of Geonosis, when he lost his squad, he challenged Sergeant Vow to a fight. And so Sergeant Vow gave him that scar. And so now he wants to kill him and they fight each other at the very end and he doesn't kill him. But he's got a girlfriend now, a Twi'lek waitress. So I guess he's not quite so closed off as he used to be and opening up a little more. Darman and Etain reunite and immediately jump into a romantic relationship. <laughs> I have thoughts about that, but otherwise he just seems like chill. And Niner, despite being the sergeant of their group, is not in charge of this investigation. He's there. He's good. Good for you, Niner. Delta Squad seem like jerks. <laughs> They're very sassy. Again, I have not played the Republic Commando game, so I don't really have any idea of these guys from another source. Just that, yeah, they're very sassy. One of them in particular, Sev, seems like a baby sociopath. Like, buddy, you okay? I know you're the sniper, but like, that kind of behavior does not seem cool. For fans of the game, it was probably very exciting to see them in Triple Zero, but for me, I was like, yeah, I know where they're from, but I don't know them. Speaking of jerks, or strong, interesting personalities, Ordo, Ordo's a lot to warm up to, because he just comes off as sort of rude. And I don't know if this is a null arc trooper trait at all, but... I definitely got the sense from Ordo more so than from some of the other clones that like he likes his fellow Nulls. He likes Phi because of what unfolded during the events of Omega Squad Targets, the short story that preceded this novel, but he doesn't really like anyone else. At times he had awkward interactions like with Bessany who works for the Republic Treasury and is auditing this situation, but at other times I definitely got the sense of superiority and almost condescension towards others, especially towards civilians. And so again, I don't know if that's a null trait as a whole or just an Ordo trait, but it made it hard for me to warm up to him because my initial reaction to him was like, ugh. I don't like you, buddy. And I had somewhat similar feelings about Cal Scarada. I liked the introduction we got to him in Omega Squad Targets. He seemed like a good guy, an interesting guy. But that story was not from his viewpoint. And I feel like getting his viewpoint here, the more we heard from him, the more I honestly didn't like him. <laughs> I feel like a lot of his character traits are very admirable that he's trained these guys the best he can, that he really has this connection with him, which you see played out in the way that they're always calling him like dad in Mandalorian. But it almost seemed like Cal Scarada had this cult of personality going on and he was like dragging people into his cult, which gave me weird vibes. And I also wondered like, how does he have this much power? Like he's just a training sergeant. How does he have six ARC troopers and then all these other dudes obeyed his word? And then how does he get people to let him carry out this mission? Like his power seemed way beyond what it should be based on his rank and his position. I appreciate what he's done to create the sense of family and community for the troopers, but it, again, it just seems to have built up into this cult, which I'm not sure was Travis's intention, but 
doesn't give me super good vibes here. And then finally, our two Jedi characters. Jusik is like hero worshipping the Mandalorians and the clones, which I, uh, is a worrisome attitude. On the one hand, you're like, yes, I love that he gets along with them, that he really sees them as people, but hero worship is probably not the attitude that you want to have here. And in fact, a lot of times it seemed like there's this dichotomy going on where Jusik is the good Jedi and Etain is the bad Jedi, and he's good and Cal likes him because of this hero worship. I mean, I know that the prequel era Jedi have a lot of issues, but I'm not sure this is the tract I would take. And Etain is just all over the place, not in the way that she was in Hard Contact, where she was very indecisive and slow to take action. <sighs> Here, it's almost like she wants Cal Scarada's approval, she wants the approval of the clones around her, she is like, I recognize them as people and I want them to know I recognize them as people, and I felt like she took it too far at times. And she's definitely struggling with her place within the Jedi Order, whether she wants to be a Jedi, whether she agrees with their teachings, whether their lack of attachment is something that she likes or not. I mean, obviously she doesn't like it because she goes and forms an attachment with Darman that was very fast. <laughs> and by the end of the novel, she's pregnant and she does not want the Jedi Order to know and she tells Cal about it and that was an interesting conversation. Uh, yeah, I just get the sense that, like, Etain is depicted as the the less admirable Jedi, and I don't like Etain a super lot. I think because she does fall into that trap of weak Jedi woman, but she doesn't have some of the traits that other characters like that have that make me really like them. Like, Scout from Yoda Dark Rendezvous is also a Jedi who is weak in the Force, but I love Scout because she tries so hard. She knows her limitations and she tries to counter them. Lorana Jinsler from Outbound Flight is another weak Jedi, or at least indecisive, unsure Jedi, but Lorana's sweetness and kindness shines through and is what makes me really, again, love that character. And Etain doesn't have either that sweetness and kindness of character or that recognizing of her weaknesses and working around them that Lorana and Scout does. And she just comes across as bratty at times. And her complete determination to have Darman's baby. Oh, girl, this is not a good idea. On the bad guy front, we have these separatist terrorists, but we're never in their head like we were in Jez Hoken's head in Hard Contact. So they're more of a nebulous enemy. They're out there. They're doing bad things. They're blowing things up. We obviously want to eliminate them, but we don't ever find out their reason behind doing so. We know that the head is probably from Javim, which was one of the battles of the Clone Wars. We know that the traitors within the Republic Army logistics or wherever they are, that one of them has family from Jabim, one of them's just doing it from the money, and one of them, we honestly don't know why she's doing it. And she's, they're all killed. They're all killed. So they're not really characters. We have no understanding of them. They are just bad guys to be stopped. So my first issue with Triple Zero is that after saying in my review of the previous novel that, wow, the Briticisms were toned down here. Nope, they're all here. They're all here. Kit, Recky, stuff like that. They're here. <laughs> and even a lot of the terminology used, phrases sound British, like Cal Scarada always calling people lad. I feel like if it was me as an American writing, I would say boy. But no, it's lad. Do Mandalorians have New Zealand accents, or was that just a Django thing because Django is played by Tamara Morrison? Maybe that's why he says lad all the time. I don't know. My second issue with Triple Zero was just that, in comparison to Hard Contact, which felt very standalone, Triple Zero feels bloated in comparison. I think part of that is the fact that this Coruscant terror cell investigation doesn't kick off until like 150 pages into the book. 
And even then, it's slow moving. I can understand the steps they're taking, but there just didn't really seem to be the sense of urgency that I got from the previous novel. And in fact, it like wraps up so quickly, they kill everyone. I would think that you'd at least want to take some people for questioning, but no, it's all done and we're on to the next story. And so I think triple zero didn't need to be almost 400 pages. And I think some of that bloat comes from the increase in the number of characters as well. While having Delta Squad in here is a cool nod to the fans of the video game, do they need to be here? Especially because I felt like they didn't really add much to the story beyond showing the difference between how Val trained Commandos versus how Skirata did, but we've also already seen that with a teen, so I don't think we need four other guys like that thrown into the mix. And like, I don't mind when from one book to the other, it's like different kind of missions. I feel like that's something that the X-Wing series did really well, where every book is not just dogfights. There's a lot more going on there, but I felt like at times this terrorist investigation was not fun to follow and just seemed overly dragged out. My third issue with Triple Zero is Etain and Darman's romantic relationship. Now I'm not sure if I have a problem with their romantic relationship as a whole or the fact that like it just happened. Like there's no build up here. They've been separated for a year and when they parted at the end of Hard Contact there was definitely an undercurrent there but it definitely more felt like hey these are friends. But no, when they meet again in triple zero, they have like one conversation and then it's like, hey, you wanna, yeah, let's. And then before you know it, she's pregnant and she's like, I'm not gonna tell Darman and she tells Cal Skarata and he like flips out on her. I mean, I would flip out on her too, but not for all the reasons that he flipped out on her. And I just felt like I probably would have liked this development more if it had slowly happened throughout the book. Like, I don't want Etain is pregnant at the end. Maybe just like have more of that tension between them. And she's like, I'm a Jedi, I shouldn't be doing this, but like, we get along so well. And maybe have at the very end them choosing to get together romantically instead of like, they hop right into it. We don't see really any of that tension between them. Everyone knows what they're doing. And then out of nowhere, he tains like, ooh, I'm pregnant. Yeah, I want to get pregnant. Yeah, I'm going to have this baby. And like people freaking out about it. And my final issue with Triple Zero was 100% what I believe were Travis's biases coming through. I know that Karen Travis loves Mandalorians, does not like Jedi. <sighs> and you could see that here. I think it's the way that Etain is just like such a annoying character. The way that Jusik is only good because he wants to be a Mandalorian. We have multiple references to how the Jedi are taken from their parents and that's wrong. And I was like, well, I don't think they're forcibly taken. I think their parents choose to give them this better life, give them this better thing. I think a lot of people confuse Anakin's situation, a nine-year-old taken from his mother and his mother is left in slavery with like what happens to the Jedi as a whole. Yeah, they don't have any understanding of family because they're not trained that way, but I don't think what they do is necessarily bad. I think in some instances it is bad, but not always, but it seems definitely in triple zero that Travis comes out on the side of this is bad. This is bad what the Jedi do. <sighs> and I feel too like the clone troopers being so Mando. I don't know if this is a carryover again from the video game. I can see why people really, really like it, but I'm not sure. The idea that Jango Fett went and got all these guys to train the clone troopers to make them the best they could do. I never got the sense from Attack of the Clones that Jango was anyway, like felt any responsibility for the clones. I think to Jango, being the progenitor of the clone army was a job. He got paid. He got paid very well for it and he got a son out of it. And I didn't see him as feeling 
connected to the clone troopers and wanted to make them the best they are in any way. So I guess that idea that like he personally went around and recruited these guys, uh, I don't know if I buy it. And then I could see maybe like the 100 guys and the Nulls that Cal Scarada trained being very Mando heavy, knowing about their Mandalorian heritage, using Mandalorian words. But then the way that's presented as like this has spread through the entire clone army through millions of guys. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. And I think that adds to that feeling of like Mandalorian's good, Jedi bad, when like Obviously, Karen Travis really loves the clone troopers and thinks that they've been shafted and that, you know, the Republic is bad to even use them. And like, yeah, they're not droids, they're men. But I do feel like at times she takes it too far. And I think too, sometimes that comes out in like, the clone troopers are the best. They're the best at what they do. And civilians are scum. And I'm like, hold on now, wait a minute. I'm not gonna talk trash about military guys. But like, that doesn't mean that people who are not in the military are garbage. Don't do that. So I just felt like there was a lot of very preachy stuff going on here. A lot of it didn't connect with me. And I was like, no, I don't agree with that. Uh-uh. You are trying to push my buttons here, Karen. <laughs> so again, I can see how, like, for some people who love the Mandalorians, they're like, oh, this is so cool, so much more to learn about. But then there's me who's like, you know, the Mandalorians are not perfect. The Mandalorians are not always right. So in short... Triple Zero continues on with the characters that we met in Hard Contact, but adds a whole lot more. It's a completely different kind of mission here. It's like investigating terror cells. We learn a lot more about the clone troopers and their upbringing and the Mandalorian backstory and all of that, which I think to a certain extent is your mileage may vary. Definitely there are developments for future stories going forward here, not just Etain's baby, but also that the Nulls and Skirata are trying to track down a scientist from Kamido to fix the aging problem. So next time I'm going to be reading the first book in the Darth Bane trilogy by Drew Karpishin, Path of Destruction.